Hello, and welcome to KSBO News. Today's news focuses on a special topic, infrared wavelengths. Do you know where your children are? And now a word from our anchor, Kelsey, reporting live from space. Hey guys, I'm up here in space, just looking at the stars. I mean, right now they're pretty boring, they just look like white blobs. Wait a second, I brought my infrared goggles. so clear up here, I can see straight through the dust. Guys, take a close-up of this star that I'm seeing right now. Did you know that the infrared wavelength is found right after visible light spectrum? So it falls between 750 nanometers and a million nanometers. And this wavelength was discovered by Sir William Herschel in the 1800s. Infrared cannot be seen with the eyes. So when you image this, it creates a false color. It assigns a color based on the temperature. And these can range from purple to white, where purple is cold and white's hot, or blue to white, where blue is cold and white is hot. In the world of astronomical imaging, infrared is used to capture photos of stars and galaxies. Since stars give off their own heat and light, a star is considered both a source and an object. Now, off to Brianna at NASA's Infrared Telescope Facility to learn how these images are captured. Back to you. Thank you, Kelsey. It's actually quite complex. In infrared, there are three different types of telescopes that can be used. Ground-based, airborne, and space telescopes. All three types of telescopes contain an infrared camera that must be cooled to hundreds of degrees below zero, as well as a special solid-state solid detector. Ground-based telescopes were the first type of infrared telescopes to be used to observe outer space and tend to be placed on high mountaintops in very dry climates to improve visibility. They do have limitations, though. Water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere is known to absorb infrared radiation. In 1967, scientists experimented with putting infrared telescopes on rockets, bringing them to higher altitudes, and with this, airborne infrared telescopes were born. The most Recent to reach the stratosphere was NASA's Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy in May of 2010. Completely eliminating the interference from Earth's atmosphere, infrared space telescopes were beginning to be launched. In, 18, or in 1983, the most significant of infrared telescopes that was launched was the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, which revealed information about other galaxies and information about the center of our galaxy and the Milky Way. The Spitzer Space Telescope, formerly known as the Space Infrared Telescope Facility, was launched in 2003. The planned mission period was to be 2.5 years with the pre-launch expectation that the mission could be extended to five or slightly more years or until the onboard liquid helium was exhausted. Without the liquid helium to cool the telescope to the cold temperatures that was needed to operate, most of the inf instruments are no longer usable. For more information on the detector inside the telescope, we report to Olivia. Thank you, Brianna. Infrared detectors attached to ground-based telescopes can detect the near-infrared wavelengths which make it through our Earth's atmosphere. Telescopes, as well as our atmosphere, emit infrared radiation which can complicate the observation of cosmic sources. Thankfully, infrared telescopes are designed to limit the amount of thermal emission from reaching these detectors. Part of the Spitzer Space Telescope, as Brianna mentioned, the Infrared Array Camera, IRAC, is designed to detect light at near and mid-infrared wavelengths using four different detectors, each measuring light at one particular wavelength. Using s over 65,000 pixels per detector, Spitzer's IRAC camera trampled the groundbreaking infrared astronomical satellite, which relied on detectors with only 62 pixels per detector. Due to infrared telescopes detecting wavelengths of heat, it is necessary for the telescope and detector itself to be very cold. Because of this, the lifespan of an infrared telescope and detector is not as long as it will eventually begin to heat up. Sometime in 2018, the James Webb Telescope is set to launch just as the Spitzer Space Telescope is reaching the end of its time. Like many infrared telescopes, the James Webb will utilize mercury-cadmium telluride in the detectors. 
Because of the heating fact I mentioned earlier, the detectors of the James Webb telescope will range from a chilling negative 389 to negative 447 degrees Fahrenheit. The latest in detector technology is the quantum wells photodetector. Unlike previous infrared detectors, this one absorbs all of the rays in one detector with different layers to detect each band of the infrared wavelength. NASA's QIP detector is a gallium arsenide semiconductor chip with over 100 layers of detector material on top. The specific detector use, uses quantum mechanics to trap electrons so that only light with a specific energy can release them. When light with the correct energy hits one of the quantum wells detectors in the array, the electron then flows to another chip above the array, known as a silicon readout, where it is then recorded. A computer then uses this information to create an image on the infrared source. From here, we pass it on to Sam Biscavage, reporting live with more information on the imaging and storage of infrared wavelengths. Hey, I'm Sam. Welcome to the IPAC Caltech Building. IPAC stands for Information Processing and Analysis Center. And this is the place where we take infrared uh, images and process and analyze them. We support astronomy and planetary space missions and emphasizing the infrared astronomy aspect, and we conduct functions for NASA missions, administrate data management tasks, and optimize several major projects. We support other organiza organizations besides NASA as well, including NSF and other privately funded projects. It's our mission to provide information and the knowledge through education and research through infrared and its uses in astronomy. For our full mission statement, you can go to our website, once the infrared images are captured, we can actually use digital image editing software to process it and add colors so that the image can be seen by human eyes. One way you could do it is by using Photoshop to digitally modify the image. You would open the image in a raw format and adjust the white balance, and then duplicate the image so you can still have the original one to work off in case it's a mistake. Um, you would then create a couple layers, including one for color levels, a channel mixer, and a hue saturation layer. Once all of these are adjusted and look good, you merge the layers together um, and change the blend mode until you're satisfied. And then you're good to go. Um, you have a colored picture from the infrared capture. IPAC also has archives for data storage uh, that house all of the images that we collect. Uh, they're stored there for processing and then for eventual viewing. Thank you, Sam, for that great information. We'd like to thank our sponsors, IPEC, Caltech, and NASA, and our viewers like you. Have a great night. Just kind of give it like a funny, serious look. Okay. Ready?